Good day, this is Ms. De La Torre, and at this point, we're going to talk about the good life. In this particular lesson, we are going to talk about the different um, things such as intellectual virtues, public good, and the green economy, and how they influence our view of having the good life. Last time, we already talked about the difference between moral virtues and the intellectual one. And we made mention that intellectual virtues are those that are considered to be excellent personal traits or character strengths, which are morally good for thinking and learning. And it is associated with knowledge and cognitive ability. Some examples of intellectual virtues are careful, honest, humble, and attentiveness. And technically, intellectual virtues and moral virtues comes hand in hand. Okay, It's just that when we say intellectual virtues, this virtue are the ones focusing on allowing you to acquire knowledge okay, and uh, develop your cognitive ability efficiently and effectively. Okay. We also talked about the general features of the intellectual virtues. Uh, examples are, first, they are acquired, meaning we have it or we attain it through practicing guided instructions that usually comes from what? From the people around us, especially within our household during our formative years. Next is, they are also excellent character traits, meaning it's not just like the superficial um, traits that we got, okay, but being able to apply it in real life scenarios. Like, for example, if uh, we are good when in our mathematical um, ability, okay, it is expected that somehow we get to show it through our decision making and the way we accept constructive criticism, okay. Um, so, like what I mentioned last time, it is not like um like it, it's not enough or being an intellectual person or a smart person doesn't equate to someone who has a good virtue okay or a virtuous uh, individual okay but it, it's going to be very very important that both aligns because if that the, that aligns well technically um, that's a factor that can lead to us achieving what we call as the good life okay another feature of an intellectual virtue like what we mentioned last time is they involve human emotions intentions motivations and values which focuses on truthfulness and honesty and then afterwards they are aimed at cognitive goods like what i mentioned a while ago okay the difference between moral virtue and intellectual virtue is that moral virtue focuses on the affective side. It's more on the character itself. But when we talk about intellectual virtue, it is those virtues, those values that is going to allow us to develop our intellect. Thus, the focus on knowledge, truth, and understanding. And lastly, they are means between two extremes. Like what I've specifically discussed last time, some examples of intellectual virtues are courage and humility. And as we may have noticed, okay, courage stands in between rashness and cowardice, while humility stands um, in between arrogance and belittling oneself. So again, uh, it's like the intermediate one. Okay, it's at the middle of two extremes. One is over and one is lacking. Okay. Now, if we are to ask or answer the question, what is a good life? There are some factors that affects one in achieving it. Like what I mentioned a while ago, intellectual virtue plays a role in that. But another one is pleasure. We already talked about the difference between pleasure and happiness last time, and we mentioned that both are positive emotions, right? They are good when it comes, when they're good in feelings, right? But if we are to further check it, okay, how do we differentiate the two is that first, pleasure is fleeting. It is short-lived. Okay, it's it focuses on our sensation. It focuses on 
um, meeting the needs or the cravings of our senses. Okay? And if you're going to check in here, okay, it is subjective. Though happiness is also subjective, right? Um, we may be presented with the same pleasurable thing, the same thing that can initiate happiness, but the the degree of pleasure and happiness that we may feel towards the same thing varies from one person to another. Again, because that is subjective. So with pleasure, the thing in here is that if the things that we deem pleasurable are gone, then the pleasure is no longer present. Okay? Um, so some examples of this um, primarily focuses on Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs foundation. Like, okay, usually the one that triggers our pleasure are those that meets our basic necessities or basic needs as a human being. That includes um, our physiological needs, right? Now, if we are to check happiness on the other on, on the other hand, again, technically, happiness is a long, long-term feeling. It is subjective, and at the same time, okay, more than being stimulated by an external stimulus or stimuli, okay, it's it's not something that is re reactive as pleasure is, okay. Um, it is something that comes from within okay like like how i associate the analogy of extrinsic and intrinsic motivation last time right um pleasure is something that we see or we not technically see we feel okay once that again an external stimuli or stimulus has been given or offered to us and we react to it with pleasure whereas with happiness again despite of okay regardless of how great things may be okay around us if we choose if deep inside we are not happy okay we wouldn't be happy at all okay following aristotle's idea or concept of happiness right um it works in the grounds of human flourishing okay and for aristotle happiness is like pleasure in a life well lived Pleasure and happiness comes hand in hand. We cannot be truly happy if we are not meeting the pleasurable things in life. Okay, but and again, at the end of the day, it's case to case basis. It's subjective. Some things that we can associate with happiness, furthermore, is higher level of satisfaction. Okay, whereas pleasure is, if in my own words, pleasure somehow is shallow. It touches the surface, whereas happiness is um, touching something deeper. It is of higher level okay, of satisfaction. Furthermore, it's not the things but the experience of having those things that makes us happy. Like what I also shared last time, right? For example, is it's it's not the phone itself that makes us happy, but it's the experience that the phone allows us to have, the convenience, okay, that the phone allows us to to live, okay, that makes us happy, okay, because in the long run, okay, if we are to like differentiate happiness and pleasure in a scenario where a new phone has been given to you, the 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 act itself of unboxing it during the the very very first time that's like a pleasurable moment right but after everything has been unboxed once you already are using the phone for quite some time the pleasurable feeling may have been gone but again if you're happy with your purchase regardless of how long you're using it then still that's that's happiness okay it's it lasts longer but again to, to stay within that happy state is um, a personal thing. It is a personal choice. It is something that you should put effort into. Okay? Um, again, kindness, generosity, and love, that's also associated with happiness. We all know it. And if we are to, like, simply differentiate 
pleasure and happiness. Pleasure is something that's unstable. And again, it's motivated by external factors, whereas happiness is constant and generated within. So we made mention of pleasure taking part to one's happiness and at the same time, um, what do you call this one? I'm sorry. Um, intellectual virtue and moral virtue playing a role as well into how one may achieve a good life. But at this point, let's talk about public good. Okay, When we say public good or goods, well, technically, this refers to an item or a service that can be consumed by the public. Okay, and if you're also going to check on in here, it also says that it can be consumed without reducing the amount available for others and public goods cannot be withheld from those who do not pay for it. Okay, so since we are having the term pub public, okay, we should focus on the idea that it should be available to the public. Okay, and when one gets his or her part, others should not, or others' part should not be affected. Okay, now there are two things you should uh, take note on in here. Okay, when it comes to public good, when it is being provided by the government or the state, okay, they give it to us in a service orientation. It is being pursued in a service orientation. Whereas if it's the private corporations who pursues it, who gives it, who gives it to the public, they give it to us in a profit orientation, meaning it's more on a business side. They are, they are giving the public goods so that they can generate funds out of it. They can make profit out of it. It's a business thing. If it's the government, they give it to the public because it's an act of service. Okay. Um, one key thing that you should take note of when it comes to public good is that it is non-exclusible and non-rivalrous, meaning no one should get excluded when it comes to getting public good. Okay. And there should be um no rivalry. So some example of this is the broadcasting of television and radio signals or radio broadcasting and television broadcasting. If you're going to look at it, okay, the signal doesn't, um, what do you call this one? The signal doesn't, it, it's not isolated. Okay, it, It's not I forgot the term, I'm so sorry, but it's it's not going to choose who is the only one who can get the reception. Everyone in the country can get it, regardless if you got a TV set or not, regardless if you're paying for it or not. The signal is like a nationwide thing or it's a regional thing, right? And that's an example of a non-exclusible feature of a public good. Okay, everyone has the chance to get it. And even if someone watches his or her t uh, TV, okay, others will, will still be able to do so, okay, without uh, like compromising their reception. Well, um, that depends on the TV set that they got. Okay, that's like another thing, but that's the, the, the idea. Okay, I hope you get it. Um, what's like an, an example of um, a public good that may be exclusive, okay, or ex can be exclusive to a certain portion of the population? Um, example is satellite or cable subscriptions or like the streaming subscriptions such as Netflix and all. That's like the that's one of the most common thing as of the day, right? So in this case, okay, everyone may have the reception, but if you are not going to pay for the subscription itself, then it's not going to be available on your end, okay? So whether we like it or not, well, definitely there are some public goods that are exclusive only for those who can pay for it. So that's the idea of public good. Again, it's an item or, or service that can be consumed by the public without reducing the amount available for others. And that cannot be withheld from those who do not pay for it. 
okay? But that is case-to-case -case basis because, again, there are some that can be exclusive only to a certain um, portion of the population depending on what orientation are we focusing into. If it's a profit type of orientation, most probably that is because the private good is given by the private corporations. Therefore, it tends to be exclusive. It can only be available to those who pays for it. But if it's um, in the given in a service orientation, most probably it is the government or the state that gives it to the public. Therefore, it's most likely non-exclusive. So let's try to look at the different um, aspects of the public good, like uh, starting with the political ethical sense. I'm going to talk about the concept of public good in political ethical and political economic sense. So I hope everyone's going to pay attention into this one. So let's start with the political ethical sense of the public good. So here, what we're going to focus is the concept of utilitarianism. Okay, when we say utilitarianism, this is an ethical theory that implies that a morally good action is the one that helps the greatest number of people. Meaning, if majority benefits from it, then it should be given. Okay, so we have these terms communal and national public. Obviously, if it's national public, it's the entire people, uh, let me, I mean, people of the Philippines, okay, the entire republic itself, okay? If it's communal, it focuses on a community. So here, in the case is that public good are those that are benefiting the communal or the national public as it is used by a greater number of the local population, okay? Some examples of public goods that is deemed, okay, um, a public good in view of utilitarianism are the following. We got the national defense, education. We also got the public health, public ports and highways, and social services. So we all know that whether we pay for it, I mean, like technically, if it's something that is public, Okay, it is like created in the benefit of the entire or majority of the national public. So it's it's most of the time free of charge or it is something that is um, like affordable to, to most of us. And when it comes to like, education and national defense we all know that regardless if you have something to pay for it or not it is our right to be defended by our government so that is a public good in the sense of political ethical that has been offered to us because we have the right to it okay and same goes with education right now let's talk about the public good from the political ethical sense focusing on the communal people and the public public good itself so i made mention a while ago that when we say national public that refers to the entire filipinos in the republic of the philippines but if we say communal this focuses on the people in a certain community now if i mean like I've mentioned a while ago that a uh, public good benefits majority, okay? But um, there are some instances where a public good may be deemed very beneficial to the national public, but can be compromising the state of living of a communal one. And that's another like a real life scenario okay example of that is um when we establish dams so that we can come up with or harness um its beneficial effect to generating electricity which we all know is a renewable type of energy that can be used by the national public but sometimes 
the areas where the dams are being established might not be directly beneficial to the people or to the community where it's going to be constructed, right? So in that sense, okay, the community may believe that their communal public good is not jiving with the national good. And that really happens, okay? We all know that. Now, whether to push through with it, despite of the community being compromised, okay, or not, okay, in the expense of, you know, failing to establish another potential source of a renewable energy for the Filipino people or for the national public, that is a choice that should be done by the government. But again, that's another thing. That's the reason why it's very important for us to elect leaders that is going to, you know, weigh in this kind of uh, concerns because again at the end of the day those communities are still part of the national public but still again if we follow the utilit utilitarianism uh, principle or theory diba? usually if if it is something that will benefit the most then we should go for it okay but again that really is happening now, let's talk about the public good from the political-economic sense. So, you may you may expect that in this uh, following slides, we're going to talk about economics or like some, some features of the economics, such as microeconomy and macroeconomy. Actually, these are the key areas of focus of this political-economic sense of public good. So... When we say microeconomy, the economic concept of public good in here pertains to the benefits that may be accrue to an individual or a firm in pursuing a project that will offset possible losses or adverse effects and that will likewise benefit the general public. So can you cite an example of this? Actually, if you're going to like analyze it, a certain example of this one is like the street lights, okay, or lamp poses, okay, especially if it's going to be built on economic areas or zones where business business establishments are prevailing. So we all know that. It may, it may be the local government or even the national government itself is going to provide subsidies so that we can have, I mean, we can establish, okay, uh, this lamppost. But, and that will mean expense on their end, right? That means you have to, to pay, spend a certain amount of the national budget or the budget for the people for the public so that you can create lamp poses on it but if establishing such on areas where businesses are prevailing like what i mentioned a while ago will allow them to have more clients will allow them to have more customers who's going to make their business even better okay will increase their profit, will increase their, um, like, well, of course, will allow their business to grow, then it offsets, right? It offsets the negative effect or the expenses that has been accrued by the government just to establish those lamp poses because the areas where those have been established is thriving business wise right so that's like how microeconomy in a political economic sense of public good works okay parang business lang din diba you 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 should be willing to put right uh put put a certain amount of money right 
before you can generate income, before you can generate profit, right? Wala naman dito yung wala kang ilalabas tapos you expect that a lot of money will go or will follow along the way, right? So, you have to invest a certain amount in the hopes that it is going to return bigger than the usual. So, parang ganun din yung sa micro-economy um, idea of political economic sense of public good. How about if it's the macro-economy? So, here... Okay, with the prefix macro, it is a on a bigger scale. Here, when it comes to the public good, the public good still, if it's governmental agencies who gives it, it is being provided in a service-oriented way. Whereas if it's uh, coming from an industrial or business firms, then they give it in a profit-oriented manner, Okay, meaning in a business manner. Okay, so there are some public goods we all know that are government owned, okay, or are like controlled by the corporations that is affiliated with the government. And again, like what I mentioned, if it, that's the case, most likely they give it to us in a service oriented manner. But again, this government owned or controlled corporations providing such public goods, they are encouraged to be self-liquidating. Okay? But when it comes to the point that their subsidies, okay, meaning the, the, let's say the funds, okay, when the funds given by the government or the funds allotted to them by the government starts to increase rather than to decrease, okay, and the service that they are giving is no longer somehow kumaga parang lugi na tayo. Tumataas yung input natin pero mababa yung output natin, no? Tumataas yung subsidies but the the services that we offer to the public is diminishing, okay? Or is no longer of quality. That's the time when that certain corporation, okay, is going to get privatized or privatized, okay? Meaning it's going to, to be sold to a private entity, to a private sec, to the private sector corporation, okay? So, um, what's the, the benefit of that? Actually, the reason why I put Meralco in here is actually that's one of the example or best example of this Meralco used to be owned by the Philippine government right but right now we all know that it's already privatized okay we all know that this government owned or controlled corporations they receive annual subsidies or um, like help financial help from the government now again like what I mentioned a while ago if it comes to the point that the government-owned um, corporation is no longer beneficial than it should be. It is going to get privatized so that first, it's going or the service it provides the public is still going to continue to be provided. Okay. Second, the expected or the supposed annual subsidies that is used to be given to that um, corporation will now be channeled to other projects okay so it's it's now going to be a win-win scenario though the the only setback of that is that again the government closes a corporation that acts as a channel to help the public but again it's not like a negative thing at all because they may have lost it but the supposed budget they used to give to it will be given to a different project that can still potentially help the public and at the same time the service provided by that previous or former government owned corporation is still ongoing okay it's just that this time they're no longer the one giving it but a private company okay so that happens as well okay and that's there's nothing wrong about it okay kesa naman na ipush natin na we we handle it even if we know na 
it's 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 no longer serving its purpose um if effectively or efficiently right or sustainably so that's an approach and that's how macroeconomy when it comes to the political economic sense of public good works okay when public owned or government owned corporations that provides public good can no longer sustain itself it's going to get privatized okay so that so that it's still going to continue to provide the service okay so let's now talk about the general types of public goods we have first the public public goods okay obviously ito yung common one na mentioned ko na sa inyo kanina pa okay it's a non-rival non-excludable type of public good some examples are education okay health services trade and industry if it's private public good this is where the public good has been offered by the private sector okay sometimes it could be 100 percent owned by a private company others it could be a private company in collaboration with a certain um agency of the government okay so here the private public good as they see their is being set up by the private sector because they see the realizations as profitable and they also value the general public's benefits though the the thing in here is that a public public goods is non-rivalrous and it's non-excludable this one has rivalry and excludability okay for example are the internet service provided by several isps or in internet service providers okay uh, my rivalry because these isps has different like bundles or plans data and um like data and messaging or phone calls plans sometimes they even add um, video on demand streaming subscriptions as well within their bundles right so yeah parang you have the chance or the choice to choose which isp you're going to go for depending on the services they offer and it's going to get exclude the they, they have this excludability because again if you do not have the money to pay for an internet service then you won't be having such though as time passed by we all know that internet actually is not internet service uh connectivity is no longer a want but rather a need it's a common necessity especially in this day and age right next one is mixed public goods so in here it's like a merge of the public and private public goods okay because the service or the the public good is service oriented like how it is in a public public good but the ones giving it are those from the private groups or the private sector most of the time these are like the non-government agencies or organizations that seek no profit okay but to only help the uh public okay to provide or to meet the common good of the communal or the national public so that's an example of a mixed public good it's it's an intermediate of the public public good and the private public goods last one is the public bads okay from the term itself it's the negative goods that the public avoids or not tolerates okay uh it's it's both not being tolerated by the public and the private sectors so the obvious examples of these are the corruption pollution and crimes though most of the time during the early early days or phases of such public bads we just tolerate it but once it's it's starting to affect us and like directly um directly harm us that's the time when we usually start to do something about it like for example demand loss to avoid corruption okay pollution and crimes so at the end of it 
okay, all of those, intellectual virtue, pleasure, happiness, public goods, all of those plays a role in achieving the good life. Okay, so we are going to go back to the concept of eudaimonia of of Aristotle. Diba? Sabi nga niya, human beings are, um, or like in the context of eudaimonia, human beings are inclined to seek deeper sense of happiness than mere notions of pleasure in the absence of pain. We are no longer just aiming for a life that has no pain on it, but a life that really is um engaging meaningful okay something that will allow us to flourish okay something that will allow us to personally develop to have purpose to have meaningful relationship to have good health and to have a great contribution to the community and all of those can only be achieved if again we are aware of the concepts of public good because that's that's one thing eh? that's one one thing that we require diba? we need for us to to survive so if those basic needs such as public goods are not given to us how can we achieve pleasure how can we achieve happiness at the same time despite of the public good being given to us, if we, on the other hand, doesn't have intellectual virtues and moral virtues, how can we enjoy those public goods? How can those public goods meet so that we can feel pleasure, so that we can be happy if we are not going to have intellectual virtues so i hope you get to see the connections of those things i've mentioned just a while ago contributing to the what concept of a good life um but class i'm not saying that um, i'm i i'm i don't think i have this intellectual virtues as of the moment and i don't think I have access to all of the public goods. Does that mean that I'm not going or I'm deemed to not have a good life at all? Plus, no. Okay. Again, um, at the end of the day, I'm just trying to share with you a point of view, okay, that has been given to us how to have, like, a good life. Pero naniniwala ako na, alam mo yun, may kanya-kanya tayong lipad. Right? At the end of the day, it is only you who can determine if you're able to live your life well or not. If you're able to to have a good life. Okay? These are just some guiding principles that you may use as a guide, as a to give you a clue what are the things to take note of along the way as you move on to the next section of your life. But again, at the end of the day, it is you who was going to determine whether you've lived your life well? You're you're too young, actually. Bata pa naman, masyado pa kayong bata, no? To to really say that have I lived a good life already? Marami pang dadating, marami pang mangyayari. But at least we have an idea, no? Binigyan tayo ng idea ni Aristotle. Paano nga ba? natin masasabi or ano nga ba yung mga bagay that will help us to know how we're able to live a good life right so before i end the discussion about the good life let me just tell you something about green economy okay from the term itself i i know you have already an idea if it's green that means it's off or related to the environment i actually included a um video discussion on in here um from youtube discussing what green economy is and i want you to watch this one or that one that video whose link is going to be available in our m rooms later on after you've watched this video discussion of mine 
it's going to talk about what green economy is how how is it help us to us helpful to us okay but just to give you a heads up i i want you to by the way you can click this portion on in here in the presentation i've given so that you can get directed to the link discussing what green economy is okay but if you want still i'm going to share the video itself over our m rooms just to give you a heads up green economy is this one i don't know it, why these fonts are all overlapping i'm so sorry but on my end during the time i'm creating the presentation it's not but anyways okay uh, when we say green economy according to the united nations environment program okay this is a result of improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risk and ecological scarcities here's here's like uh, a summary of it okay if we are living in um, a community where we have low carbon emissions we have low carbon footprint low carbon growth and we are able to facilitate an efficient management of our resources and at the same time there is social inclusive inclusivity meaning there's social equity we are not discriminating one from another when it comes to the resources that we can use it means green economy is able to allow us to have sustainable development because at the end of the day if you're going to look at it all of the things that we are using right now comes from where it comes from the environment right it comes from the ecosystem where we are part of but if we are to check like what has been shared by this infographic in here the poverty rate as time passed by is what it is lowering and that's very very good right if you're going to check on in here two decades of unprecedented growth have greatly improved welfare and the poverty rate is decreasing but at the expense of what at the expense of our environment right this another or yes this this one it's another uh, infographic showing how as our lifestyle improve our environment degrades we are developing at the expense of the deterioration of our environment and we all know that a large portion of our environment is non-renewable right Our ecosystem has provisioning functions. By the way, that's another aspect or asset that we got. Our environment, the natural things we got of it is known as a natural capital. Our natural capital provisions, regulates, and enriches our culture. They provision through the means of crops, the wild plants, genetic resource, wood and fiber, and energy. Those are given to us by our natural capital. Whereas they regulate our global climate, our uh, they control our flood, they are able to help um, ensure water quality, okay? they regulate pests. These are just some some of the key benefits that we get from our natural capital the main goal of, of the green economy is for us to use our natural capital sustainably diba nga sabi dito a green economy is that one that has a low carbon resource efficiency and is socially inclusive its development Path should maintain, enhance, and rebuild our natural capital as a critical economic asset and as a source of public benefit, especially for those in the marginalized sector that works directly, no? Works directly sa natural capital natin. Okay? 
So I want you to watch that video to fully grasp what natural capital, I'm sorry, what green economy is. But simply put, it is like harnessing the benefits or the advantages of the environment without deteriorating it. Kumbaga, we develop together with our environment. Kaso, is that, re- is, is, is that hap- what happens right now? Do you, what do you think, class? How far are we from a green economy? I'm going to ask you that question in our face-to-face class, and I hope you get to share your point of view about it. Okay? If you don't have any more questions about this one, that's all. Thank you very much, class, for listening. And once again, this is Miss De La Torre, and that's how you have a good life.